First of all, I think almost all economies have less risk than the United States, whether they're developed or developing. Uh, the United States is unique in the enormity of the risk, especially the risks that very few people perceive. So I think that you know, you're in much better shape if you avoid the U.S. market, bonds, stocks, you know, just kind of totally, and focus internationally, where I think the risks are there, they're just not as, uh, as severe. And I think there's a lot more upside. So in exchange for accepting that risk, I think you have a disproportionate uh, upside potential. Whereas the United States, I think the upside is very limited and the downside is, is, is quite substantial, especially when you view it from the prism of, uh, let's say, gold, uh, real money, as far as how much value U.S. assets may in fact lose if you price those assets in gold. You can't simply look at what the price of stocks would be or bonds in dollars if you have a moving target because the dollar is collapsing. Uh, and so it's hard to measure the value of something when your, your ruler is constantly shrinking, right? So you, you're not going to get a, a, a good result. So I think look, looking abroad and investing abroad and in, uh, foreign stocks, uh, dividend paying value stocks, I mean, that's what you want to do. That strategy has been paying off. We substantially outperformed the U.S. markets last year with positive returns in our dividend payer strategy and our value strategies. Uh, even despite the strong dollar, because these were all international stocks that managed to, you know, close the year, you know, in the black, you know, while the Nasdaq was down 30%, you know, and, and, and the smaller declines in the S&P and Dow, but still substantial declines. I mean, I think they will benefit. I think commodity prices are headed much higher, and that would benefit Brazil. I mean, there are a lot of other things that could benefit Brazil. I don't know if they'll happen. Uh, but I have some investments in Brazil because I believe that the commodity boom is, is still young and has a long way to go. And I think Brazil will, will benefit from that. And they're not the only country that will, but, but they're one. Uh, but, you know, Southeast Asia in general, I think, is going to do extremely well as a result. I mean, the countries that are producing the most and saving the most are the ones that are in the best position to prosper during the coming decade. It's a country that is dependent on debt uh, and consumer spending for its GDP growth, countries like that, which, of course, you know, United States is the poster child for that kind of a dysfunctional economy. Uh, those economies are in a lot of trouble. Yeah, I think it's quite probable that silver will outperform gold, especially as we get to the, you know, the latter part of the bull market in uh, precious metals, which I think still has a long way to go. And yes, I think that there are new uh, uses for silver. You know, at one point, silver was uh, big in photography. And, uh, you know, digital photography kind of uh, temporarily put an end to that. You know, so you didn't need as much silver for, for photography. But, you know, there's all sorts of new uses that are being discovered for silver that will more than supplant the fact that it's not used in photography to the degree that it was. And so I think, you know, for both industrial and uh, precious metal purposes, I think you're going to see significantly, significantly higher silver prices. Well, I mean, I'm pretty bullish across the entire spectrum of commodities. You know, if you're going to have very high inflation, then all those commodities are going to go up in price in relation to the currency that's going down in, in, in value. But, you know, obviously there are some classes that I think might do better than others. Uh, I think that the uh, agricultural commodities can be particularly strong. Um, and some of the industrial metals, I mean, you know, will do well. I mean, you got and, and energy, but that, you know, that's pretty much the whole gamut. I mean, the big, the, the big uh, uh, commodities. But I think as the emerging market consumer really comes into his own, as the dollar crashes and these occur currencies rise, and now you have billion, two billion people that all of a sudden can buy a lot more stuff than they could before. I think that the nature of what they buy is going to be far more commodity intensive than what Americans used to buy before they went broke. So I think that this emerging market boom is going to be very bullish for commodities across the board. And so I think they should be owned. Uh, you don't have to necessarily own 
the commodity, like have a commodity futures account and just buy some soybeans or some crude oil. You can buy businesses that operate in industries that will benefit from rising commodity prices, in particular, you know, agriculture commodities, if you want that exposure. So you, you can be you can own a piece of a business that makes more money when agriculture is booming, when uh, prices are, are rising. So it, it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good strategy. Or there are certain currencies that are you know, related to certain economies that will get a boost to their GDP from uh, improvements in terms of trade as a result of higher commodity prices because they export a lot of commodities. So you could just own businesses in economies that will benefit from a rising commodity price because it will increase uh, the, the wealth of everybody that's living in those, in those countries and increase the relative purchasing power of their currencies. And you know, you're looking at countries, let's say like Australia, that would benefit from that. And Brazil was one that would benefit Canada has a lot of, of commodities. I mean, you know, the United States too has some commodities, but you know, the problem is we have a lot of other problems that, that offset the benefits that we get from, from commodities. Uh, so your Pacific Asset Management, again, that is my uh, asset management company. It is a SEC registered investment advisor, and we work with individual uh, customers. Uh, we uh, manage portfolios that we build. I have a team of portfolio managers that here here working with me. And so if you're interested in having my team and myself manage a portfolio that you have, and maybe you currently have it uh, with another uh, investment advisor or brokerage firm, or maybe you're doing it yourself, uh, but you think we could do a better job, uh, which I believe we can, <laughs> you could become a client of, uh, of my uh, registered investment advisor, contact uh, their representatives. You can see the, the website, europac.com, above my shoulder. You go to the website, there's a, an 800 number that you can call. If you, you know, would prefer to talk to an advisor about the strategies and, and how they may or may not uh, fit into your overall investment plan and whether or not they're suitable uh, for you. Um, so you got that. Then if you want some physical precious metals, which everybody should have some, you could uh, contact Shift Gold, just my last name, gold.com, and uh, you know, talk to the representatives there and get yourself some gold and silver before getting gold, buying gold and silver costs a lot more money or a lot more, you know, better reserve notes that are going to lose value. And make a habit of following me on social media. You know, I've got almost 950,000 Twitter followers, so hopefully I'll crack the million level this year. I, I put out a lot of uh, interesting tweets. In fact, I just highlighted one yesterday where I was watching these uh, Senate hearings and uh, the senator was asking, or one of the senators was asking this uh, guy from the FDIC, hey, your stress tests were bogus because you only tr tested for falling interest rates. Why didn't you stress test for rising interest rates? And I pointed to a tweet that I did three years ago in which I said the exact same thing. I said these stress, stress tests are meaningless because they're not testing for what's actually going to happen. Under their worst case scenario, they're assuming that interest rates fall. No, the worst case scenario is that they rise because <laughs> the banks are going to be very vulnerable to rising interest rates uh, and rising inflation. And I, I, I hit the nail on the head on Twitter. So the people following me on Twitter are, are a lot more informed. Uh, than the people who uh, are relying on information from the Fed or anything in, in the mainstream media. So follow me on Twitter. I'm also on uh, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. I mean, we'll see how much longer Americans enjoy the freedom of being able to access TikTok. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, but I'm there for now. So follow me there and make a, a, a habit of listening to my podcast. I do two to three a week in general uh, on shiftradio.com. And you can also, if you, you know, prefer to, to watch me as opposed to just listen, you can go to my YouTube channel and there's video. And I, I, I do uh, these, uh, 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 you know, the, the, the podcasts on YouTube and, and, you know, you can watch them, listen to them and share them with your friends. Make sure and subscribe to my YouTube channel. I've got about 540,000 subscribers there. So, uh, you know, a lot further to go to get to a million. But I, I have a feeling that by the time this financial crisis is over, I'll have more than a million. 